I remember a special day when I was five years old. As usual, my mother was listening to the radio in the kitchen uh, as she worked, did her chores. And I went in and I said, Mom, why are all of these songs about love? And she said, Philip, love is the most powerful force in the world. Did you know that the Bible teaches that God is love? Now that was a learning lesson. I thought God was a bearded guy up in the clouds. God is love. And so that percolated in my heart and I grew up in a wonderful uh, community in Walkertown, North Carolina. Uh, wonderful people at Marsh Chapel just like you folks that are here at Hillbrook. They nurtured me all along the way and my faith grew. So let's move ahead to May 1966, the day before I graduated from East Forsyth High School. We were the first class at the new consolidated high school in East Forsyth to graduate after being there all three years. And so a well-respected coach wanted to speak to our class. Coach Muskin, the baseball coach. And he stands up and he says, Class of 1966, we've enjoyed having you here so much. And before we let you leave, there's one last lesson that we want to teach you. And he says, this is an important lesson, and here it is. Always remember you're never fully educated until you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. Good luck in the future. God bless. And he sat down. Well, you could imagine we were in awe. I mean, we, we didn't know what to do with this. As kind of a, as a group, we stood up and gave them a standing ovation. That lesson was very important for a lot of our class because several of the boys were headed to Vietnam. It was important for me because two months before I got the bad news that my 44 year old mother had terminal cancer. And so I knew I would have to walk uh, steadily with this Jesus through the days ahead. Uh, I was going to college, I wanted to be a doctor, headed to college, four years medical school, all that training ahead of me. And I knew I needed that Jesus with me. So I, I made it through college, made it through med school, came here to Raleigh and started practice. Married Ann, we had a family. Uh, joined this wonderful family here at Millbrook and our faith grew along. Retirement came. All through that, I, I remember those lessons uh, as outlined in John. I mean, the same lessons in many places in the Bible. The fact that we are God's. God is with us. We can rely on God. Uh, if you believe in God, that displaces fear. Uh, and that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, this idea was reinforced when I read a book in 2012 written by Evan Alexander, a neurosurgeon from Harvard. Uh, it, it turns out that this was the son of my neurosurgery professor at Balmain Gray, Evan Alexander Jr. His son, Evan Alexander III, had a serious brain infection that put him into a coma uh, for a week. During that time in a coma, he had an intense experience of God. Up to that point in time, he'd heard the stories his patients told him about seeing the light and the out-of-body experience, and he thought that was just maybe their disease or the medication they were on making them hallucinate. But it became real for him when he went through it, and he dedicated his life uh, thereafter. Uh, to spreading that word. In the book, he talks about how he experienced the hugeness of our physical universe. And he says that words leave him 
when he tries to talk about the immensity of God's love. He said, I would say maybe a thousand times greater than the physical universe we know, but that doesn't even touch it. We are so loved. And so that message resonates exactly with what John was trying to tell the churches in this letter. God loves you. God really loves you. <clears throat> There's another component to, God, to John's letter, and that is how do we treat our neighbor? We are to love our neighbor. Well, that means a lot of things to a lot of people. How do you love your neighbor? Uh, for me, um, it is best outlined by uh, a scholar named C.S. Lewis who wrote a book uh, in the 40s, Mere Christianity. You know, England was under attack. The BBC came to this well-respected uh, scholar and said, would you do a series of radio shows on this important question of if God is loving, why is there so much suffering right now? And C.S. Lewis had worked through this in his personal life. He was an atheist and still until he studied uh, the literature of our forefathers and um, debated with his friends. And he came to realize that Jesus is the only answer to how our relationship with God uh, and our humanness is rationalized. In that book, he says that the way we love our neighbor is to project the good things in our life onto our neighbor. And so you can take it a step further and you could do that with your enemy. If you feel love and peace and kindness and gratitude and empathy in your heart, you want that for your neighbor. You want that for your enemy. In fact, if your enemy had those characteristics, they wouldn't even be your enemy anymore. As a Christian, I'm not supposed to have any enemies. Jesus said we can't have enemies. There's no such thing, but they seem dead set on us being their enemies, so we can pray for them and hope for change. As I went through life, I needed uh, the, the truths told uh, in that letter uh, from John. And so I started preparing for this talk. I thought about um, this coming Tuesday is All Saints uh, Day. And I thought about our forefathers here uh, at Millbrook getting this church started. And I wondered what their life was like. In 1869, when this church started as a brush arbor, uh, Raleigh was still under Union military law. Uh, they, they, we had an elected officials yet. Uh, to go to Congress. Uh, Confederate money was no good anymore. So you know the people that met here had their, their struggles. In 1869, Fanny Crosby uh, wrote uh, a hymn, To God Be the Glory. And I would like for us to stand in a minute and, and uh, sing that hymn. Uh, after we do that, I would like for us together uh, to say the Apostles' Creed that was written by our ancestors 1,700 years ago. And after that, I would like for us to sing the oldest hymn in the hymnal, the Gloria Patri, which started out in 3rd century as a Latin chant, and now it's been put to music. So let us stand and sing uh, Fanny Crosby's great moving hymn and think about our forefathers. 